Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And tonight, we're doing part two in our post-quantum series. This time, we're going to talk about quantum cryptography. So if you're joining us and you didn't listen to last week, you may want to go back and check that one out first because we talked about kind of an introduction to quantum computing, which can help prepare you for tonight's conversation. And just to give our listeners again a little context on why the sudden interest in quantum computing and quantum cryptography. Well, it's I, I said this on last week's episode and I'll say it again. To me as an information security professional, what I get very numb to and kind of skeptical of are anytime there's a boogeyman or the sky is falling or it's the end of the world and the heat death of the universe or anything else like that. I, uh, my skepticism kicks in and I want want to learn about it and understand the reality, which sometimes is as bad as it sounds, but a lot of times isn't, or just at least have that context to, to better inform myself and others moving forward of what the actual risks are and how close they are to being realized in the real world. And so Andy really was the one who got this interest and got this bug to go do this research on quantum computing and quantum cryptography uh, based on a, a message that had been sent at work, a link in, in the chat kind of spawned this whole rabbit hole of research. And so Andy has kind of shared the results of his research with us. So again, last week, that overview on quantum computing. So if you're not familiar with concepts like qubits uh, or anything like that, go back, check that one out, and then come back and listen to this one where we're going to talk about the implications of quantum computing on cryptography, which is so fundamental to so much of what we do in information security. So Andy, if you would, why don't we first start by talking about traditional cryptography and how that works, and then we can contrast and compare. Yeah, absolutely. So the most widely used cryptography algorithms today are public key cryptography. There are many different types, but the ones that are used for encrypting your communications with Amazon for your purchases or for encrypting different communications or data, it's all pretty much private key encryption uh, cryptography, like RSA, one of the most widely used algorithms that are out there. And the basis of public key cryptography is prime factors. That's the math behind it. The people who designed RSA basically wanted something that was simple to propose, but difficult to solve. And so that is the factorization of primes. So for example, if I gave you two prime numbers, it's very easy to find the product of that, say 73 times 77. A classical computer or you can solve it just by doing the multiplication and finding the product of those two primes. However, if I gave you the number 5,621 and told you to find the prime factors of it, the two numbers that are multiplied together to get that number, it's going to take you a while. You're going to take 5,621 and divide by two, and then maybe divide by three, and then, you know, and so on and so forth until you get to 73 and you find out that it's 73 times 77. So that is a very simplified one, but then take like two to the, I don't know, 3,467th power, and that's a prime number that you're going to try to factor. That's going to take you a very, very long time. In the private key infrastructure, public key uh, cryptography, I should say, the public key contains the product of the two prime factors, and then the private key contains the two primes, which are the ones that are hard to find. So if I gave you the, the public key containing the large number, it would take you a very, very long time to find out what the prime factors are in my private key. And that's what makes our encryption schemes work. It's not necessarily that you can't find it. It's just that it's so difficult or it takes you so long to solve for. 
which is kind of the basis of information security in general, right? Like we know that if we're targeted, that most likely a hacker is going to get in, but we're going to try to burden them with layers of security and make it difficult or take too long that they'll just kind of move on and, you know, figure out a different target. And that's what makes public key cryptography work is that it just takes too long to solve. And we're talking like the keys that are being used today take millions, billions of years using the most powerful computers linked together in classical computers in order to find the prime factors. So this is not something that you're going to sit around for and wait on. The main issue is that what we talked about last week is with a large enough fault tolerant quantum computer, you can solve for this type of math problem in a matter of seconds. So there's a guy who was named Peter Shore in 1994, and he came up with a quantum algorithm before the first quantum computer was actually developed which is just crazy to me. Like these guys are sitting around thinking of theories on quantum computing and they're like, yeah, I think I can come up with an algorithm to solve for public key cryptography using math that it, you know, theoretically exists. But he came up with an algorithm called Shor's algorithm in 1994 that theoretically could find the prime factors of a large enough integer with a large enough quantum computer. Now we talked about last week where we're still very far away from developing a large enough fault tolerant quantum computer in order to pull off some of these algorithms. But again, the theory is there and we're already starting to develop quantum computers physically on a small scale. So this is something that we do need to pay attention to, to prepare for and understand that once we have that computer, everything that we know of will can be broken within a matter of seconds. Now, recently, even our government has kind of put out statements and agreements and initiatives to mitigate or at least make aware that we should start moving in this direction to mitigate the risk of quantum computers to cryptography. The White House came out with a statement that's promoting United States leadership on quantum computing. There was even a statement at the G7 um, with, um, with many of those nations to try to have a joint effort to move forward because this is all could be a risk to national security. One other thing that I think is important to note is that even if you are using traditional cryptography to encrypt things, If your data is stolen, there is a fear right now that cyber criminals, nation states, they may sit on that data, even though it's encrypted. They'll just sit on the encrypted blob until quantum computers are available, and then they'll decrypt it later. So if you're sitting on like some state secrets, like KFC's original 11 herbs and spices, and that is stolen and exfiltrated from your organization... They could just sit on that, and then 50 years from now, when quantum computers are available, they'll decrypt it, and you've you've lost you know the one thing that your company is based on. So, it's still important to secure things as much as possible, even though you know it can't be broken today. It may be you can still steal the encrypted blob and decrypt it later on. I think that last piece is is maybe the scariest bit. But at the same time, you know, I kind of talked about at the top of the show, like boogeyman, sky is falling, heat death of the universe. Like right now, there isn't really anything actionable you can do about it. Um, you know, the, the cryptography we have that exists today is still theoretically, I mean, for all, not theoretically, in all practicality, unbreakable, I should say. And there isn't anything else you can really do short of air gap it, not make it digital at all, those sorts of things, you know, but I mean, if you're going to use um, computing resources, 
what we have today is again, for all intents and purposes in all practicality unbreakable. So, you know, what, what can we do? Um, we can run around saying the sky is falling, quantum's coming, um, or we can kind of keep doing what we're doing, but keep an eye on it moving forward. But again, I mean, like that's, that's a very real threat. And I believe I've seen it speculated that some foreign governments that are adversarial in nature to the United States, we'll just kind of leave it at that, have actually been doing exactly what you're talking about. They are harvesting massive amounts of encrypted data and just storing it away in cold storage for quantum to make it possible to break it. You could sit and eavesdrop on the internet and just eavesdrop communications. And then, you know, at some point in the future, go decrypt them. Although what's the likelihood they're really that interesting or important, you know, whenever that day comes. And again, we don't know when this will be possible. I think I was going to say if or when, but maybe it is better to say when, but it could be a long, long way away, you know, yet too. you know, you'll hear some speculation. Oh, this is 20 years away, 30 years away, 50 years away. Um, everybody's just guessing at this point. We don't know uh, when that will be possible. We just know with a theoretically powerful enough quantum computer, it would break this. So it's an interesting conversation for sure. And I think that dovetails nicely into, well, if we have quantum computing that can break this sort of thing, do we have quantum cryptography to defend against it? Yeah. Perfect segue, Adam. So computer scientists and physicists have already obviously started thinking about ways to make public key cryptography more secure by coming up with encryption algorithms that are resistant, tough, or near impossible for quantum computers to crack. And so they do this by using protocols that rely on mathematical problems for which quantum computers don't bring an advantage to. Like we talked about last week, quantum computers are very efficient at solving specific things, but they may not be efficient at everything. And sometimes they're actually worse at doing some calculations. So in quantum cryptography, data's encrypted using photons or particles of light. And so this is the part where I'm going to try to explain to you how quantum key distribution works, which is very different than public key exchange. So just like if I have a private key and you're using a public key to encrypt it, I use the private key to decrypt this in classical cryptography. But in quantum key distribution, it's important how that is used for quantum communications. And that is kind of the basis of quantum cryptography or what we often say is actually quantum resistant cryptography or post quantum cryptography. But in this case, we're going to talk about the quantum key distribution. So instead of using the product of two primes, like we talked about at the top of the show as your public key, you use quantum mechanics to come up with a random key using photons. So in this case, I'm going to be the messenger, Adam, you're going to be the recipient. So I'm going to send Adam a randomized polarized photons stream that they vibrate in multiple directions, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, left to right, using a filter, multiple filters, actually. And Adam, you're going to receive them and you have to measure which direction that they're polarized using different polarized detectors one photon at a time, you know, and back and forth between different detectors, guessing which filter I used. So let's say I used a filter that sends it horizontally and you guess in detector A, that horizontal photon will measure maybe, let's call it zero using your detector A, but then the horizontal Photon will measure one on detector B. So let's say you have two detectors. And so that kind of gives you the zeros and ones. And I'm sending them through these filters that align these photons in different directions. You have multiple detectors, which will give you your zeros and ones that you're guessing which one I used. The the key of zeros and ones are derived from this process. And the, the recipient, in this case, Adam, you're going to 
tell me which detectors you used, A or B, for each of the photons. And then I will let you know if you are wrong based on the filters that I use to encode the, the photons. So what happens in the end, and I know this all sounds very confusing, but essentially I send them through different filters. Adam, you have different detectors that kind of guess, and it's all randomized, which one is the ones that I sent. And you tell me which ones that you use on the detectors on, and I tell you if you're right or wrong. On the ones that you're right, we keep those bits. On the ones that you're wrong, we throw out the bits. And in the end, we have a number of bits that are aligned, and that is our key. So, according to quantum mechanics, the recipient has a 50% chance of guessing the right filter. And that's kind of the basis or the, the theory behind this whole randomization and getting the key. Then now I can use that key to encrypt the message through a traditional channel and use the quantum key to decrypt it. The private key contains the order of the polarized photons, which is required to decrypt the message. So your public key contains your uh, your detectors, right? The order of your detectors, but the order of the photons that I send through is really part of my private key. Like, unless I have the order, you're not going to know which bit is what, right? The, the bits are out of order in, in that sense. And what's great about this whole system is any eavesdropper that's going to try to like sniff the key along the wire if they get into the system they're really out of luck because i don't even know the order of the photons that i sent through because as i said in the beginning it's randomized and that's kind of the thing about quantum where you're using these different phenomenons right so i'm using randomized photons and so there's no way to actually sniff the key because i don't even know it and if an eavesdropper hacks into the system and they try to, say, copy the photons midstream, they will possibly change the direction of that photon alignment. And if they do that, that'll change the key. Because as soon as you, Adam, receive that photon, it's been the alignment's been changed, and you'll know when we match up the bits on the key that it's not right. And so I'll know before I even encrypt and send my message that we've been hacked because the key has changed. So super powerful because an eavesdropper has to measure the photons in order to get the key. But when the key is measured or the photons are measured, the key changes. And so you've, you can know you've been hacked even before you send the message because of this fundamental aspect in nature. Quantum cryptography hides information not by using a computer, but by stowing it within essentially the unknowability of nature itself, which is, I guess, the best way that I can explain quantum mechanics as a layman who doesn't really understand it is that I don't think anyone really truly understands it. So in practice, though, this is much more difficult because any small disturbance can change those polarizations as as well. And if you're off by creating when you're creating these protons and sending them out, I'm sorry, when you're off when you're creating the photons, if you're off by even like a degree, then there's going to be errors on the other end. And these errors will add up. And it's really difficult to exchange these light keys over a long period of time uh, over a long distance. So when quantum cryptography was first tried in 1989, a key was sent only 36 centimeters from a computer named Alice to a computer named Bob. Newer models today have been able to send quantum keys over 200 kilometers before the photons get absorbed by the fiber optics that they're actually sending them over. So the key actually degrades over time because of the properties of light traveling over a long distance. So that's the main issue in quantum 
cryptography and key exchange is that they can't really have secure communications over a long distance. And even if quantum encryption becomes viable, much of the internet today will have to be rebuilt because we're using a different form of encryption. And as anyone knows, trying to switch that, that, that in itself may take 20 years. Like old forms of cryptography are still lurking around. Like when was, you know, the last time that we talked about like SHA-1 hashes or something like that, you know, those are, have been, made insecure for a very long time there's probably still windows xp computers that are out there so that old technology just lingers so it's just going to be a long time before we even see quantum encryption being used mainstream nist recently came out and has been in the news because they finally chose the first group of quantum resistant cryptography algorithms after a six year effort starting in 2016. There's additionally four other algorithms that are under consideration for inclusion in the standard and NIST plans to announce the finalists at a future date. From the first group, there was one chosen right now for general encryption for securing things like websites and it is called crystals dash kyber and if you think that sounds familiar it's because it is it's named after the kyber crystal which is used to light up lightsabers in star wars so someone on the crystals team was obviously a star wars fan and among the advantages for crystals dash kyber It's mostly small encryption keys that two parties can exchange easily, and so it has relatively high speed of operation. For digital signatures, which we use when we need to verify identities during a digital transaction or sign documents remotely, this chose three algorithms. First one is called crystals-dilithium. The second one is called falcon. And the third one is called Sphinx Plus. And again, if you think that sounds familiar, if you're a Star Trek fan, it is because it is. Dilithium being the fuel for warp drive engines. So the Crystals team, obviously a bunch of geeks on there, big Star Wars and Star Trek fans. Three of the selected algorithms are based on a family of math problems called structured lattices. And I'm not going to try to even pretend to explain that to you. I tried to look (laughs) at the websites for this, and it was just over my head. Sphinx Plus uses hash functions, which I kind of understand. (laughs) Um, There are four additional algorithms, like I talked about, that are under consideration for general encryption that do not use the structured lattices or hash functions for their approaches. So it's another encryption scheme or math problem that is being used. So NIST is obviously already moving forward. And I would say, you know, this is also preliminary. These algorithms are all under development. Quantum computers are moving. So a lot of this could change over the years just because they've picked something doesn't necessarily mean like, Oh, this is the stuff that we're going to use forever against quantum computers. It's all a moving target, but at least we've got something, and that is good. It provides a little bit of guidance for people who are possibly among the early adopters, right? So that's kind of the news and breakdown of quantum cryptography as we have it today. I think a lot of that conversation at the end around some of the cryptographic algorithms that NIST has selected first love some of the names like the crystal skyber uh, as an example. But I, I think your last point was really, really important to lean into. And again, kind of drawing comparisons back to the early days of public private key cryptography with classical computing. And you think of how you had PGP kind of come out and was almost literally smuggled out of the then Soviet Union, where it was created, 
Um, and then how cryptography greater than 40 bit cryptography was kind of sort of illegal in the United States until the mid 1990s. And uh, Lotus Notes worked around that by giving part of their 128 bit key to the federal government. And like you think of the, the different hashing algorithms and the different cryptographic algorithms and how we've discovered almost all of them have like weaknesses and they need to be deprecated and discontinued. And we've had to go turn off TLS 1.0 and all those sorts of things along the way. Um, we're not going to hit it out of the park on the first try here, but if you think about how we got to a pretty good state with cryptography today in classical computing, it came through iteration and it's going to be the same story here. So on an infinite time scale, if you're listening to this podcast as like some sort of archival uh, recording in the, you know, near the end of the, uh, the 21st century and you're laughing at, at how primitive it is, you know, I, I, I make no bones that these are going to be the algorithms of the future forevermore when quantum computing arrives, but it's a place to start. And I think that's overall the entire conversation is really where we've got to be today is, is there's a birth of something somewhere and we're kind of witnessing that. And it's fun to see this kind of grow up and develop over time. And, you know, just one other comment as well, the whole description of that quantum key exchange and with the photons. And I think you were talking about how, you know, originally they were centimeters apart, Alice and Bob, they weren't learning application security, by the way, they were Alice and Bob were exchanging quantum keys. Uh, and now it was at least 200 kilometers away um, over fiber optics. And you were talking about how, um, some of the internet infrastructure may need to be reconsidered long-term. Like that's all super interesting stuff. Um, and if it sounds like super different, it's because it is right. Because what we have today, like the concepts we have today are going to dramatically change. And I think most of us got in this business cause we like change. Uh, but we like incremental change more than we like wholesale change. And so this is going to be, I think a challenge for all of us to, find the right context for this. Because again, this is not the boogeyman that's knocking on the door tomorrow. We're not all doomed. Classic cryptography is not dead by any means, but there is the possibility that someday, yes, everything that, that today is practically unreadable becomes easily readable. That's scary, but there's not a whole lot we can do about that right now. And we don't know when that might be a problem. So We'll monitor it and we'll observe it and we'll go from there. But certainly an interesting thing to think about as we look towards the future of our industry and our business and how we'd be impacted moving forward. And so, you know, my hats off to Andy for doing all the research and homework on this and bringing it to me and the listeners. I've certainly learned a lot along the way, and I look forward to further updates on quantum computing and quantum cryptography because I feel like we're only scratching the surface here and there's going to be more to come and I'm excited to learn about it. I just wanted to add a side note because often Adam, you have a very deep knowledge of mm -hmm. computing history. And I think when you talk about some of this stuff on how computers came about and I learned something and I think it's super interesting. I came across this little bit of information, which you actually just casually <laughs> dropped in your uh, stream of, of thoughts there, where you said cryptography was actually somewhat illegal, which is because back when cryptography was getting started, it was actually added to the like national security armaments list, kind of like, <laughs> cruise missiles and ICBMs like it was part of our national security armaments and that's where you're saying that it was actually kind of illegal because it was like the regular Joe couldn't use it because it was a national security weapon and there was like a lawsuit or something that forced the government to admit that cryptography being based on math is actually public knowledge and should be available to all people. And so 
I just ran across that like in one of the videos I watched, <laughs> and you just casually dropped that, and I was like, "Oh, that makes sense." Well, you to know, me. we should we should do some shows on like random <laughs> bits of computer history that's lodged in my brain. Um, but and again, you know, like you went down the rabbit hole with this. So one of the rabbit holes I went down is why the hell did anybody ever use Lotus Notes? Like it's the most miserable piece of software I've ever used in my life. And as I did research on it, what I discovered was. At the time, in any encryption greater than 40 bits was apparently illegal um, or something like that. And so Lotus Notes kind of did this little backroom deal with, I believe it was literally the federal government, where it was, okay, our customers will hold 40 bits of the key, and then you, federal government, will hold the rest of the key. And so we'll effectively have 128-bit encryption against hackers and uh, foreign adversaries, um, but for the federal government's purposes, uh, private enterprise in the United States only had 40 bits of unique encryption that they didn't know about. And so that was like a way to make it okay. So that's why like a lot of financial services and banking and a lot of regulated industries initially all went with Lotus Notes and stayed on it so long is there was a period of time, especially in the early to mid-1990s, where Lotus Notes had the best encryption in the industry um, compared to everyone else. And so... That was like a total random, again, rabbit hole that I stumbled down and, and learned more about, mostly because I wanted to understand why was this miserable piece of software ever popular. And and that's how I discovered that. And then like on on some other notes, like PGP being smuggled out of the Soviet Union, um, the origin story of PGP, pretty good privacy, is actually super fascinating as well. So that's other, um, you know, if you want to do some light reading, dear listener, uh, those are some things to go check out. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap everything up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed these two episodes on post quantum cryptography and, and quantum computers. I certainly did as I was researching a lot of this. So thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.